Welcome, guys and gals, to City Building Doctor. Look at that logo. Ah, oh, it looks fantastic, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, my name is GamerZack, and welcome to City Building Doctor, where generally you guys would submit a city to me, uh, and I would have a look at the city and solve the problems. But today's episode is something a little bit more special. I have 10 points on my phone in front of me right there. I have 10 points. And these 10 points are sort of a frequently asked questions and stuff that people generally don't quite fully understand or know about in Caesar 3 and some of the future impression city building titles because it's never really properly explained. So in today's episode, it might be a slightly shorter one. It's not gonna go past an hour, I think. But we're gonna go through these 10 points, and these 10 points are a basic housing block, uh, climate and prefectures, employment and walkers, gatehouses, broken roads, getting and accepting on warehouses and granaries, destination walker, market ladies, and uh, the wheat priority thing, uh, thinking of your city as a system, and the aging population. These 10 points are sort of never really talked about in in-game, and it's stuff that people are very confused about. So, first of all, let me load up uh, one of the sample cities I will be using today. It's submitted by Fede? Feed? I don't know how you pronounce that. <laughs> um, but here we go. This is Fede's city or Feed city. Uh, so thank you so much for submitting this city. And uh, I'm going to be using some examples here and also uh, on on some uh, uh, some of the blank maps just to get things out of the way. So thank you so much for submitting this city. We will be coming back to this because first of all, I want to go over, I'm just gonna go to Valencia. I like Valencia, it's a nice map here. I'm gonna slow things down. And we're gonna cover the first point, which is the basic nine by nine housing block, which m most of you should know about, but if you don't, uh, well, now you're gonna find out about it. So we're just gonna clear up some area here, right? And just so you know, if you're in chat right now, type out a question at GamerZack and I'll, it'll highlight and I should be able to see it. Today is not too much of a stressful stream, I'm not trying to save a city or anything. Uh, you can ask questions there, and if you're watching this on the YouTube VOD, just ask a question in the comment down below. And of course, you can continue the chat over at my Discord channel. There's a city building section where you can ask myself or other people there other city building enthusiasts uh, questions and for suggestions and advice and guides and stuff like that. Link to the Discord channel in the description down below. Anyway, point number one, the 9x9 nine nine housing block. Now, it's sort of important to know the 9x9 nine nine housing block. It's not the only way to build housing blocks, but it's sort of the, the most basic. And the reason why it's nine by nine is because it's sort of determined by the range of a fountain. So let me go ahead and draw a nine by nine block here. So I'm just gonna go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And then we'll wrap that around. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So this, on the inside where the houses are, this is nine by nine. So technically the block goes up to uh, 9, 10, 11 by 11 with the road. And then if there's stuff around it, it's more. But the housing blocks in here, this is 9 by 9. And the reason why it's 9 by 9, we're just going to speed this up so we get the people coming in, is because let's get a reservoir hooked up here. Uh, let's hook up this aqueduct. And we're going to put down a fountain right in the middle, which is currently out of range. Sometimes I do underestimate how close these need to be. I'm just going to put it right there. Okay, so that should cover that. Yep, so once people start moving in, where are they? Let's speed this along. So this is the standard 9x9 nine nine block. You can see there, if I turn on the water tab, the water range from a single fountain covers it perfectly. Now, just as a note, on desert maps, the range of a fountain is 7x7. Seven seven. So there is actually just a smaller variance of a 9x9, nine nine, which is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. I think that's right. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So that would be the 7x7. Seven seven. On desert maps, that would be the maximum range of a fountain. Now, you don't have to actually stick to this because 
you know, if you were, for example, to design a slightly oddly shaped block, let's say something a little bit more unorthodox, you can always just put multiple fountains. There's no, no problem in, in doing something like that. I mean, you could just... There's fires, yes, don't worry about that. We'll let the people burn. You can just put as many fountains as you like, and you can make the block any shape you like. But the 9x9 is just sort of an efficient, simple block to have, and the 7x7 on desert maps, because you can fit quite a few people here, and even with services around the edge, you can have more houses and stuff like that, no problem. So it's just a nice block to have. Don't worry about the fires. Don't mind them. <laughs> and that's just the, the 9x9 block as it stands. And it's something that you should know about, regardless of whether you're going to use it or not. It's something you should know. Now, one interesting thing about this is having houses on the outside, which we will get to later when it comes to employment walkers. But that's point number one. Point number two. Uh, prefectures. Since all of this has burned down, Quite often you'll see people in the comments saying, you don't need prefectures on this map, you don't have to place down prefectures, because prefectures uh, stop fires. Now, when it comes to fires, let's slow the game down again. Fires rely on the climate. So there's three different types of climates. So on Valencia, a map like this, fires are normal. If we look at the, the map here, these, uh, these cities tend to be somewhere around the Mediterranean region here, uh, usually on this side, in Italy or somewhere over here. These maps, which are placed in the middle, are sort of average weather. It's not too hot, not too cold, it's nice, and, and it, it sort of, you tell the difference by the color of the grass. You see, this is sort of a pale-ish light green. Now, if you were to move further north, so for example to Lugdunum, the famous map that people struggle with, you see the grass is much more rocky, much more dark, right? And if we look at the map here, we're in the northern territories. Now on terrains and climates like this, fires do not happen. There is no chance of a fire breaking out at all, right? So why do you often see me placing prefectures anyway? Because prefects from prefectures do a number of things. They do put out and stop fires, but they also clear out those, those rioters on the street. So if you don't want them there, prefects will clear those out. And then there's also, they do actually help with invasions. So for example, if uh, let's say you had a bunch of prefectures over here, and there's an invasion here, the prefects will actually go out and, and well, they'll fight those guys, uh, which can help in a cinch on, on tough military missions like Carthago uh, and stuff like that. And they also, here's something that you won't actually know about unless you, you've played through the campaign. There are gladiator riots. So on Valencia, on the previous map, there's actually gladiator riots. And uh, gladiator riots, well, just send gladiators rampaging through your streets. And prefects uh, existing on your streets is actually one of the best ways to stop those gladiators. Or at least delay them until your troops can get there to, to wipe them out. So sometimes it's useful having prefects anyway. But if you're trying to min-max, you don't have to have prefectures on maps with this color grass. Now, on the opposite end, let's say we go to Tarsus, this is a desert map. So not only are we going to be using the 7x7 seven seven blocks here, if you're using a standard block, it's going to be 7x7 seven seven instead of 9x9 nine nine because the fountain reach is shorter, uh, fires are more frequent, so in that block, uh, and many other places, you might want to put two prefectures instead of one. You double up because on desert maps, it's harder. So desert maps are generally considered more difficult because fountain range is less efficient and fires are more frequent. So that's point number two, climate and prefectures. Now, point number three. And again, any questions, put at Gamerzak in chat. And if I miss it, just ask it again. Um, point number three, employment and walkers. So this is something that a lot of people get confused on. Uh, let me just check. Uh, people move in. Do people move in from the red side or the blue side? Let me just double check this. I was getting a little bit confused. Oh, they're coming in from here. Okay. So since we're on this map, let's go ahead and set up a seven by seven block here. So I'm just gonna put one. Okay, let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. 
So here's a seven by seven block and we're gonna put down some houses here in a standard seven by seven block fashion. And let's put down a reservoir and we can get a fountain right in the middle. And as I said, this is a desert map. So let's go ahead and put down two prefectures. So as you'll see here, if we check the water overlay, overlay, it's only seven by seven for the fountain. Now, one thing people have sort of wondered is, let's say you have industry over somewhere else. Let's say, well, let's just go to raw materials, timber yard. Let's say you got a bunch of timber yards over on this side. People will often uh, not do this because well, the houses are over there, so how are people going to come over this side to work on these timber yards, you know? And people would often like have to put plenty of houses like that to be like, oh, okay, now we've provided access for workers to work at these timber yards, but you don't have to do this. You see these brown walkers, these guys. These guys just have to pass a single house. And for backup, sometimes I place two houses just as a backup. And to speed this along, I'm gonna get rid of these houses here so we can get things moving in a little bit quicker. Once they pass a single house, you can see here, no employees live nearby. Let's shorten this road for them. As these brown walkers pass right by those houses, these things start working. That's it. And they have full access to employees. And you see they require 10 employees each but there's only four people living here. Once they pass a single house, they have access to the entire worker pool. So th these guys, these, these timber yards, have access to people from all over the map. Good. So sometimes you don't want to have these little, uh... and by the way, I need to put down engineer's post to make sure things don't collapse as well. You don't want to have too many tents around the map. So you want to make things a little bit more efficient. What you can do is you can have a house on the, the block, the main block, which let's say you've fed, you've upgraded, all sorts of things. And of course, on this map, you're gonna need a second fountain to evolve that house there. And now you could have a road that comes around like this. Let's say we wanna do something like that. We could have this road come around like that. And we'll make this into sort of a loop, just roughly. It doesn't have to be like this, but there we go. And we could then go ahead, put a prefecture and engineer's post on this side, and we could have our industries right there. So now, if we ignore that we've built that, now you can have industry working while that road is touching a house that's on the main block that you will be feeding and upgrading. So this way, you can have working industry without any tents. Now, I know these are tents now, but let's say we've upgraded them because on the inside of this 7x7, we'll have the market, we'll have all sorts of things, and it'll be great. And also, just as a note for uh, efficiency of blocks, when you place things, especially larger buildings, let's say an amphitheater, it's a three by three building, place it on the corner, right? It just has to be touching one tile there, right? And again, even if it's a two by two, sometimes you could make it a little bit more efficient by placing it right on the corner there. So it's just touching one tile because it allows you to have the, like all these tiles at the back here would be wasted if it was just placed. If, let's say we put the amphitheater right here Instead, you're wasting a bunch of tiles. You're wasting two tiles more than you need to be. So especially on the seven by seven block where it's smaller and there's not much room to, to move around, you wanna be very efficient with uh, your building placement. Now, that is employment walkers. So how do these buildings get employees? It's these brown walkers, they need to pass a house and then they have access to the entire worker pool. So this is the most efficient way of doing things because you get to upgrade the house rather than placing tents. But let's say you have, for example, a bunch of farmland or industry on, on this island and you, it's not really near anything. You just have to place a couple houses and it's good. That's employment and walkers. 
Next up, gatehouses. Probably the most frequently asked question. Point number four, gatehouses. What are they for? Now, quite often, you'll see people do something like this. And maybe you guys do this as well. You'll have a road coming out and you'll put a gatehouse like that. And then let's say you have some other loop or block over here. And you might have two gatehouses like this. Now, if you do something like this, it's defeating the purpose of the gatehouse. What does a gatehouse do? It me a gatehouse blocks these walkers from having the option of an intersection. So for example, you see these guys walking around here. If we watch them long enough, you'll see some of them walk up this way. And if they walk up this way, they might go back the way they came. So let's just have a look at any of the happenstances here. Like, see that school child? Walked up this way, up this road, came back, basically covered no houses, right? So this defeats the purpose of a gatehouse. What you're supposed to do with a gatehouse is build it right up against the road, right? Just like that. And now you can have this road connection and there's no intersection. Even if I rotate this so you guys can see it a little bit better, there's no intersection. Every time a walker spawns, they will walk around the block, 100% covering every house in the block. Rather than like that school child coming here, walking up this road, coming back, going back this way, and not actually covering any of those houses, right? So again, if you had a second block over on this side, you'd want to put the gatehouse something like this, but this one I'm doing something slightly different, you'll see. See, the thing with gatehouses is by default, they come with these two roads next to them and you could delete that road. But strangely, if you rotate the map, the road comes back. So to prevent this, you wanna put a building there. You could put anything, you could put a theater and now you'll see the road can't come back because something's there. But again, if you delete that building and you rotate the map, it comes back. So you gotta be careful with that. Because sometimes putting a gatehouse right at the corner is good because it's, a gatehouse is not good for desirability. Now, the gatehouse mechanic acts as a roadblock mechanic, right? And in future impression titles, Pharaoh, Zeus, Emperor, a roadblock is something that's built into the game. But in Caesar 3, there's no roadblocks. So that's why we build gatehouses and also how to use them. Fantastic. Now, let's go over to our submitters map yeah fede or feed i don't know how you pronounce it sorry <laughs> now we're gonna be talking about broken roads but also just as a note you'll see he's gonna and done that that common mistake lots lots and lots of people do this you see this road there's a gatehouse there but you know uh there's still an intersection right so uh and also just as a note Walkers that need to walk through the gatehouse can still walk through. So for example, a market lady with a destination, they can walk through gatehouses. We'll get to a bit more on destination walkers later, but if, they, if a walker has an objective somewhere specific they are walking to, they can walk through gatehouses. So immigrants, market ladies, an, a, uh, an actor going to a theater, things like that, those can walk through. But wandering walkers like priests, and uh, prefects and stuff like that, people with no destinations, can't pass through. Good. So point number one, two, three, four, five. Point number five, broken roads. I'm gonna uh, just slow the game down here a little bit. Broken roads is one of the most common things that I see when people send me maps or screenshots or videos. And it's uh, not so much broken broken, but it's... There's like unnecessary intersections and roads. So for example, that's, uh, it can be things like this, a road extending out to a gatehouse, which is generally not very good. Uh, sometimes it's, uh, let me see if there's a good example. Let me go to an overlay where I can see things a little bit better. Uh, so you'll see like this would be considered broken road. Uh, sometimes on a loop, you can't really see things properly. And I've seen the case where there's like a missing tile or two right? Because it might be hidden behind an amphitheater. So it's like, oh, you, there's a complete loop here. But actually, there's a couple missing road tasks. So you got to be careful. Those are just common mistakes. And you can see here, uh, our submitter has gone ahead and expanded his blocks with extra fountains. Uh, though, if we look at this 
current problem. Uh, if you build blocks like this, it can be very difficult to keep things stable because when you combine two rectangles, that's a lot of intersections. The walker could go this way, could go this way, then it'll be too long, they'll walk back to where they came from, or they could complete a, a circle here, but they'll never walk up there. Giving these walkers choice. In the walker system of old impressions titles, giving the walkers choices up, it's bad. Never have choices, uh, provide choices for these walkers. So all of these broken roads, you definitely want to fix up. Sometimes it's, it's just like... Uh, it could be something as simple as, like for example here, there might be an intersection. Doing this could cause a bunch of buildings to burn down, right? Because a prefect could just walk up this way, use the intersection, go back that way, and they'll never cover this area, which means you're gonna place more and more prefectures. So this sort of thing here. If we have a look at this road, this intersection can cause problems. How would we solve this? Well you would make this let me just go to the water overlay into more of a loop so we'd have the road do that easy no intersection same function same purpose everything still works as it is but there's no intersection there that's fixing a broken road fantastic easy enough and you just got to keep an eye out for those. Sometimes, ah, there you go. You can see here there's an intersection. We don't actually need it. Here there's an intersection. You don't need that. You know, something like this where the roads aren't quite connecting. You might want to connect it up. You know, stuff like that and get rid of that intersection there. You got to be careful with these paths. Sometimes it's hard to see where the a little bit of road is sticking out. Anyway, that was the point on broken roads. Fantastic. Next up, getting and accepting. Okay, this one I'm gonna load up Valencia. Getting and accepting for granaries. So let's, oh, granaries and warehouses. Let's go ahead, what's the raw materials on this map? Clay pit, timber yard, fantastic. Let's go ahead and just build a housing block. Is that a nine by nine? I think that is actually a nine by nine. I think I got it right. <laughs> Just by estimation. So let's get these people moved in. We're gonna need some houses on this side. We'll get down. It is not a nine by nine. It looks like a nine by nine, but it's not quite. It's okay. Don't let your OCD get to you. So we're gonna have a road. Actually, no, let's, we're gonna have a road coming out this way. So let's put down a gatehouse. We will fix that road and we'll fix it by placing a building there. So let's put down prefecture and engineer's post while we wait for people to move in. And this is something that's very, very nice and simple to do. Housing block, gatehouse into some sort of farmland. But you see there's a problem here. There's no houses on this side. So we'll do our little trick. I'm gonna put a house there and we're gonna have a road come around like this. And I think one, two, three, four, five, six. That looks good. We'll have a looper road here. And we'll clean up any of these broken roads. And again, we could make this a bit better with a gatehouse. And I think that actually counts. <laughs> it looks a little messy, but that actually works. So we're gonna have a house here. So that means we can have prefecture and engineers post like that and you can see how efficient this sort of thing is ah Whew. is it possible uh the zinc films as how about with no gatehouses you are actually able to build setups without gatehouses but if you're at that point you don't need this tutorial <laughs> with gatehouses is generally easier so now as we move on, let's get these houses evolved a little bit. So let's go ahead and put down a reservoir. Get a reservoir a little closer to there. Get an aqueduct connecting these up. That should activate those fountains. Yep, just nice. And let's get people moving in. So I'm just going to garden this up a little bit. There we go. Actually, we don't want those gardens. And I'm actually going to move this fountain to that side because on this side, 
I'm gonna be doing the other thing. I'm gonna have a separate road here. To do something like that. That might be a little long, but I'm not too sure. But it's okay, we're gonna put down Prefecture and Engineer's Post. We'll see if uh, it's too long. And meanwhile, we can actually go ahead and put down some farms. So I'm just going to go ahead and put down a wheat farm and I'm going to put down a vegetable pole farm. I'm going to have two granaries here. One here and one here. And this one is going to be set to just accepting vegetables. And this one is going to be set to accepting wheat. And here's a problem that's with Caesar specifically. Granaries actually have a road here, which means this is, it just by default has intersections. It's not the best, it's, it's a little tricky to deal with, but because of those, you often want to have extra prefectures and engineers posts because those intersections can mess things up. Okay, uh, the stream is stuttering quite a bit, but uh, it's just, it's not on my end. I'm not dropping too many frames, but we'll just keep going for now. Anyway, we've got a bit of food being set up here, and you can see because of these intersections, employment can be a little difficult. So to stabilize employment here, yeah, I'm going to put down two houses there, right? So because these brown walkers, what seems to be happening is they're actually getting lost in the intersections rather than passing these houses. So that's not very good. Anyway, it seems like this loop is not too big. And we're going to set up another industry here. Clay pit. And I'm going to go ahead and put down a couple pottery workshops. And a warehouse that's going to be accepting pottery and will not accept anything else. It's always good to have a single warehouse dedicated to a single resource. Now in Pharaoh and future iterations of the classic city builder, you can actually set it to accepting to quarter or accepting to half or accepting to three quarters. So you could actually have one warehouse set to accepting, uh, uh, well, like half pottery, half furniture, which would be very good. And I'm also gonna go ahead and set up a timber yard. Can I fit this anywhere? Ah, oh, I think if I just have this aqueduct do something else, I can go ahead and break this open. And I'm gonna put a timber yard right there. And I'm gonna have two workshops for furniture. And I'm gonna have another warehouse setting to just accepting furniture. Okay, that looks good. Food is starting to come in. People are moving in. Let's just make sure, are we dealing with... City is short by some employees, so I'm gonna go ahead and bring in more people. And we'll just have more fountains at the back there. You can see that when you hover, you can see how far the fountain is actually gonna reach. I think we just need to do that. People are disgruntled because I think the gods are irritated, so just to make sure we don't actually have to deal with any of these inconveniences. I'm gonna put down a temple to each god. There we go. And those will start working very quickly. Are we just short on people? Yeah. Unhappy people. <laughs> Never mind. Now, I think... We can just sort of make people happier by paying them more. Money is not really a, an, a concern here. So there we go. Are these actually... Yeah, these are actually hitting. Okay. So, as you can see, resources are starting to come in. Now, getting and accepting are two very different things. Accepting means, let's say this farm has produced a bit of wheat and now needs somewhere to put it. It can put it in any granary or warehouse that's set to accepting or getting. It can put it in either one. Now, the main difference is accepting just sort of receives the resource, right? It just sort of 
accepts it, right? Not that it's self-explanatory, it accepts it. But you can set it to getting food, right? Getting is something that's slightly different. If I were to, for example, put a granary here, if I set this to accepting wheat, it will never get the wheat, right? Because this wheat is all just going straight into this granary, it's not gonna come here. If I were to... Same with the vegetables. Let's say I set this to getting vegetables instead, right? So this granary is now gonna send out a cart pusher. You see this guy here? And he grabs the vegetables and he brings it to this granary. Look at that. And now the vegetables are over here and not there. Nice, right? It's nice. And as this farm continues to fill here, this granary will continue to get that. Looks good, looks good. Now people are still moving out of my city, so I'm just gonna prioritize that. So our industry is actually working at full capacity here because I want to get the next bit set up. And I just need one unit of pottery to come in here. Okay, there we go. This warehouse now has one unit of pottery. Now, unlike the granaries, which need this road connection, right? Unlike the granary that needs this road connection, we can now solve our employment problem by getting rid of that. Warehouses do not need a road connection. So let's say I have this warehouse here and I want pottery to come over here. I can set this to getting pottery, right? And this getting pottery will do something that took me a long while to notice actually happened. Uh, it, it's quite special. So this here is set to accepting pottery. We can't have both at getting. This one's at accepting. And a warehouse that's set to getting will actually go and get goods. Now, I'm not sure if it needs to actually have four units. It seems to be that we need four units. So people are moving back in, which means we can speed things along. Let's get our clay pit back down with our pottery. We'll speed things along. Ah, instead, do we have four units of furniture? Yeah, let's go ahead and set this to getting furniture as well. And it seems, there we go. There's furniture here now. It sent a cart pusher out and got furniture from here and brought it back to here. And you can see there is no road connection between these. Now when something is set to, when a warehouse is set to getting, it will get up to 800 units, which is two, well, eight units sort of uh, there, which is a quarter of the warehouse. So you could actually set something like this. Let's say you want oil, wine. You could have this. You can have a warehouse going out and getting four resources to fill it evenly, 800 units each, but it takes time for the, for the cart pusher to walk over there and get it. So usually I don't like having more than two. And quite often I would have just one warehouse set to getting just one resource. Good, good. So granaries need road access between granaries to get. Warehouses, warehouses do not. So you can do something like this where the resources are separate. Now, why would you want to have your resources separated by a road. Well, um, it's because of the market, ladies. <laughs> if I were to put down a market here, let's say I wanted this market to buy furniture, but not pottery. Now, there's not really any reason why you'd do that. You'd want to prioritize pottery, but let's say you want this market lady to buy furniture, but not pottery. Well, furniture and pottery are over here. The market lady has no way of getting these resources, but she now has a way of getting furniture. So, in this case, we've separated this so the market ladies will buy what we want them to buy. Now, in future iterations of Classic City Builders, again, in Pharaoh and onwards, you can set markets to what they want to buy. When you right-click a market, you can say, okay, buy this, buy this, don't buy this, don't buy this. Right? It becomes much easier. But in Caesar 3, it's more complicated. So, 
This way, with the getting warehouse, we can now go and get the resource we want this market to buy without the market lady saying, hey, these houses need pottery. So I'm just gonna walk down all the way over here and get the pottery and bring it back. Which not only means, let's say this pottery was over here. Or for example, we set up a pottery industry over here. If there was a road connection from this market to this coast, the market lady will actually walk all the way over there to get the resource. And during the time that, that one market lady is out getting a resource, the resources in the market runs out and it takes so long for the market lady to come back that these houses start devolving because they can't, uh, they don't get the resources. Now, if I load up Feder's map here, let's slow things down. A unique issue is happening. If we look here, these markets have almost no resources. So there's pottery, but there's no food, right? Why is there no food here? Look at this, there's a granary filled with meat, right? These market ladies behave very, very weirdly. So first of all, if we go to the commerce and food stocks, we get to watch this market lady. What is this market lady coming back with? I'm taking this. Every I've got no oh, she's coming back with wheat. So Fresh right? Back to my and market. she's coming back with just a bit of wheat. If we actually watch this market lady come back home, the wheat's almost immediately spent out because it's gone to one of these houses, which the, there we go. The meat's gone into there, a hundred wheat. That's it. Right? She walked far, far away to get wheat. Now look at this, where's she going again? Let's speed things along. Is she gonna go get the fish or any other important resource because this market is now empty? No, where's she going? She's coming down this way, okay. She's coming all the way down this way, walking far, far away. And where's she going? She goes into this granary. This granary, which is getting wheat. So what's going on here? Well, first of all, there's this weird thing in Caesar 3 where if there are multiple types of food available, they're all considered equal except for wheat. Wheat is a priority, right? So market ladies will go and buy wheat above everything else. It doesn't matter whether these granaries are filled with, to the brim with fish. They will walk halfway across the map. They will walk all the way across the map. They will walk as far as possible to get that wheat which is terrible. You can see these houses are starting to run out of everything because this market's just empty. Because the market has two different walking ladies. There's these guys, the distributors, and these guys, the getters, right? And there can only be one getter for each market. All right, so these market ladies do have that problem of prioritizing wheat and also walking across the map to get a resource. So that's why you want those separated regions, the, the resources that are separated. Now the main problem is that warehouses can go ahead and get food. Warehouses can go ahead and get food um, without a road connection, but granaries cannot. So for example, in this particular setup on our submitters map here, uh, to get, building the villas here is not a good idea because although we are importing wheat, to bring the food in. Fish needs a road connection to a granary or it needs its own way of getting food. So that's something you have to keep in mind when building a villa area. How is the food going to get there? And quite often what you would do is you would have the villa area over on this right side here and you'd have a separated, you'd have a separated section producing fish just for the villa area. And you would have these warehouses on getting resources to bring it in. And that pretty much covers getting and accepting, right? Accepting just allows resources to come in, getting is something else. And in this particular case, getting food here is sometimes quite difficult. Let's say you have all this, th these food production facilities here. To get food down here, these guys have to walk all the way down here and sometimes it's so far that by the time they walk here and back, the, the fishing wharf is ready to produce food again. So what you would often do is put a granary near the fishing wharves 
set to accepting meat and setting these to getting meat. And that means these would put food into here and this granary will go and get 800 units of, it'll get, it'll, until it fills up actually, it'll get all the meat from here and bring it over here. And the card pusher here can be much more efficient than the individual card pushes from the fishing wolves because the individual card pushes from the fishing wolves just carry a hundred fish. Whereas the card pusher here carries a lot more than that. And then you could, for example, just place as many granaries as you like all in the center here, all set to getting fish. Something like this. Now don't follow this example exactly, I'm just giving an example. So now we have five granaries here, all set to getting fish. And getting, they can't get from other granaries set to getting. So all five of these are now going down this way, grabbing the fish from this granary and bringing it back up here. So all these fishing wolves can just continually dumping the fish into the single granary and bringing it all here. And there's no limit to, to this system. The more granaries, the more it moves. Perfect. Now, on to the next point. Uh, Destination Walker. Destination Walker is something that's a little bit interesting. I'm gonna go ahead and load up uh, another map here. Let's go over to Lugdunum. Actually, no, let's go back to Valencia. It's just a nice map to work with. So, Destination Walker is something that's quite interesting. Let's say we have two sections of houses. We're gonna have houses there, we're gonna have houses there, and they're split by a gatehouse. And let's have these people move in. So we have two sections of houses. Now let's say we want to provide entertainment. So we're gonna put down an actor colony and a theater. So now we have an actor colony and a theater providing entertainment to this area. This is somewhat inefficient because what we can do is put an actor colony on this side instead. And if we look at the entertainment overlay for theater, the actor colony will produce a walker that will walk to a destination. This is why it's called destination walker, right? So now with one actor colony and one theater, we are providing theater access to two separate areas. Would you look at that? This is Destination Walker. Now, ignore the fires. <laughs> As usual, ignore the fires. This Destination Walker can be very, very powerful, particularly when it comes to a Hippodrome, right? A Hippodrome, you can only have one of them, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, you can only have one Hippodrome. So if you only have one Hippodrome, you would assume that you could only have Hippodrome access to one area. But if you were to build a chariot maker somewhere far away and the road would connect through a bunch of stuff up to the hippodrome, the chariot would actually walk all the way along the road and it could provide access to a bunch of houses up until the hippodrome. Same concept with this. Now an interesting thing with this is, if we'll go check out Fede's map here, for advanced players of Caesar 3, the Destination Walker actually applies to market ladies. So this market lady that is going out here to get a resource, that market lady, although is getting resources, distributes as well. So for example, if you were to, let's say, have a market that's here, that's fully stocked, right? This market here is fully stocked. Let's say we want, well, we place these houses here. If this uh, wheat granary was over on this side instead, let's say here is set to getting wheat. So the wheat granary is over on this side. This market lady will actually walk past these houses in attempts to getting wheat, right? So. Are we now off to get more wheat? I think we are. So let's go ahead and simulate this. I'm gonna put down a reservoir. I'm gonna put down a fountain. Does that have access? I think it should. There we go. 
So these houses evolve. Now where'd that market lady go? There we go. This market lady is walking by here. And it seems to be a little bit problematic. Come on, those... There we go. It's provided food to this area here. So if we speed this along, we could actually evolve these houses quite significantly. There we go, we've evolved it a little bit more. We could put down a theater. Now again, we don't need an actor colony. We just need a, an actor to come around this way. There we go. What else do they need? Basic educational facilities so we can put down a school. Let's get a school going. And there we go. And the market lady is going to come by this way again. And she's now carrying pottery. So we should be able to pro provide pottery to this side as well. Or... There we go. Needs access to a local bathhouse. So let's go ahead and provide bathhouse access. It's just... Oh, that's out of range. So let's place it there instead. And this should work. It does have... It's just no employees live nearby. We gotta wait for the brown walker to pass these houses. There we go. And we got a bath walker going around here. Which should pass these houses soon. There we go. And we've now evolved these houses without a market. Look at that. This is Destination Walker. It's not just for entertainment. This market lady going to get the wheat from here is pro providing all of these other resources to the houses it passes so we can evolve these houses. This could be a great way to evolve houses which are individual tents scattered around to get those people working. So that is Destination Walker. These little tricks can help a lot. And if you don't know about them, it can be a mystery on how some of these cities work. Now, the last couple points are more of a conceptual thing. I'm going to reload this city and just slow it down. It's a conceptual thing. You have to think, you know, point number nine here is think of your city as a system. There's a reason why I call this series City Building Doctor, right? Because your city is almost like a living organism. You know, it might have lungs, it might have a mouth, it might have uh, a digestive tract, stuff like that. You could use metaphors like that, but you, you sort of have to think of it as a system. How much food is in the system? You know, if you're using this getting technique, you're pulling resources into a central location and then distributing it, right? You're pulling resources in, distributing. It's almost like breathing, right? And if there's not enough oxygen, you might run out of breath. And also, if your lungs, or how much oxygen you're consuming, gets too much, you might eventually run out of resources, right? You might be, be able to pull in, a, in enough resources to the central location, but there won't be enough to get. The other problem is not being able to bring in enough, which, like in this case with only two granaries, it might not be enough bringing in. You might have enough food in the system, but not enough ability to move it around. So you've got to think of the actual supply of the resources and also how you're moving it around. So this system all has to play together and it is this living organism that you have to think of. And it's constantly breathing. Things coming in, things going out. Things coming in, things going out. And the more you think of your city as this living organism, the more you'll start to understand, oh right, this is connected to here, this is connected to here. It's all like a big puzzle, basically. These classic city builders are not so much on realistic city building, it's more on puzzle and pattern recognition. And the final point, point number 10, after point number 9, thinking of your city as a system, the mystery point which I, own, I only more recently fully started to understand is if you go to your advisors, go to your population advisors, go to census, this screen is more important than what it actually looks like. Because if you press this question mark over here, it will say uh, people, only persons aged 20 to 50 participate in your workforce. So quite often I'll get questions. I have 12,000 people in my city. I have 6,000 people in my city. Where are they? Why are they not working? Well, looking at this screen, anyone below 20, all these people down here are not working. And anyone above 50, 
all these people over here are not working. So just looking at a single bar here on the... I think that's slightly... This is slightly under 50, but this is basically 200 people. This bar here represents 200 people. Next year, or the year after that, they're gonna cross the 50 year mark. And that means 200 people that used to be working are no longer working. That's crazy. And then suddenly, you'll go to this screen and you'll see this city is short by 200 people. And nothing's changed. You haven't built any houses, you haven't demolished any houses. It's just suddenly, you're out of people. It's suddenly not working. <laughs> so this population and an aging population sort of sets a time limit. When you start a map, people move in, they're gonna be around the 20 to 30 range. You basically have uh, 20 years before your initial population starts crossing the retirement age. So if you don't win within 20 years, you're gonna start facing this aging population. And my last city building doctor covers this in more detail, but basically if, if you let your city age beyond 20 years, suddenly you're gonna be short on workers. You'll be short by 600 workers suddenly and everything will fall apart. It's sort of a soft time limit to you winning a map because as you can see here, the birth rate does not compensate for immigration. You have to keep building houses. But of course, the problem is the more houses you build, your prosperity and culture will start to drop because these rely on housing quality and your population. You gotta build more temples to, to keep the people, uh, to keep the gods happy. So continuously adding population is not necessarily a good idea. And actually, uh, one way people suggested of dealing with this is to make sure your health, uh, see here the city health is almost perfect with doctors and clinics virtually empty. The better your health, the longer people live. Look at these 85 year olds over here. If you lower your city's health, they will die quicker, making room for new people to move in. It's not kind, but it's efficient. It's just something that uh, you have to take into consideration. This aging population is something that a lot of people don't know about. They get stuck on a map and then they go 30, 40, 50 years in and then everything falls apart and you don't know why. It's probably because your working population is now a retired population. And that is point number 10. And that concludes the 10 points I wanted to cover today. That has been the basic housing blocks, the climate and prefectures and fires, employment and walkers, getting how to get walkers to, well, the, the brown walkers getting employment into buildings, gatehouses and roads, but the broken roads, um, getting and accepting, which was quite an extensive topic, uh, market ladies and the wheat priority and how the, the market ladies behave very weirdly, uh, destination Walker, I'm using the wrong finger here, don't, don't look at that. <laughs> destination Walker, thinking of your city as a system and the aging population setting sort of a time limit on you winning maps. That's pretty much it. Anyway, that's gonna be it for today. I know you guys watching on the stream have been experiencing quite a lot of lag today. It's a YouTube problem. Um, Nothing I can do about that. My internet connection is A-OK -okay on my end. Um, but yeah, that's gonna be it for today. If you have any questions, you can ask in the comment section down below and uh, join my Discord server. We have got a special channel on my Discord server, invite link in the description down below. Uh, special section channel on my Discord server for city building specifically. We've, we're almost at 100 people. Come join the community. Lots of people chatting and all of that. And yeah, that's going to be it for today's City Building Doctor. Hope these 10 points help you getting the basics going in, in something like that. And I say basics, it's sort of hidden secrets that the game never tells you about. But anyway, that's going to be it for now. Thank you so much for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. My name has been GamerZack, and I will see you in the next video. Bye!